welcome to this ICME Global Awards webinar. The ICME Global Awards celebrate chemical, process and biochemical engineering excellence and are widely recognised as the world's most prestigious chemical engineering awards. Today we'll be announcing the winner of the ICME 2020 Research Project Award sponsored by The Chemical Engineer. This award recognises the best chemical engineering research project undertaken in the last three years. Here are our finalists. We have a joint entry from Imperial College London and Solar Polar, London South Bank University, a joint entry from the US National Energy Technology Laboratory and West Virginia University, Petronas Research, a joint entry from Promethean Particles, BAE Systems, CAV Advanced Technologies, GKN Aerospace Services, London South Bank University, Opus Materials Technologies, PPG Industries, and TWI. Saudi Aramco, a joint entry from Seren Technologies and Queen's University Belfast, and finally, University College London. All of our finalists have been invited to join us today and give a short presentation on their work before we announce the winner. Subject to time, we'll be inviting you to participate in the Q&A at the end of each presentation. You can ask your questions via the questions box on the GoToWebinar portal. It's now time to introduce our first finalist, representing the joint entry from Imperial College London and Solar Polar. It's Ahmed Najiran Keribadi. Okay, everybody can see my screen. Hello, everybody. Uh, and. Uh... I'm just wondering if you can see my. Uh... We can see your uh, your desktop rather than your PowerPoint at the moment, Ahmed. Oh, so it's my PowerPoint. You can see my first. Now we can, part. yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, our work is. Carry on, about... Ahmed. We can see your uh, speaker, your your presenter view. So if you just go up to display settings at the top and switch your view display setting at the top of the screen on the on the left you'll see display settings oh, okay okay yeah and if you just swap, swap there we go perfect okay, Over to you. okay. Uh, okay i'm going to talk about uh, about my my research project since um four years ago it's about affordable net zero emission decentralized uh, solar thermal diffusion absorption refrigeration systems and uh, it's a collaboration between uh, Imperial College London and uh, Solar Polar LTD, which is a company in the um, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, as you may, as may everybody knows that, okay, um, main uh, source of energy is fossil fuels and uh, governments decided to switch to renewable energy sources. And solar energy is a good um, alternative uh, for energy. And as you can see, the central belt of Earth has a great potential for solar energy sources. Um, our main topic is focus on the cooling systems and 6.7% um, of energy consumption belongs to cooling sectors. And uh, by 2050, cooling demand will be doubled as well. Uh, and the main um, cooling system in the world is actually vapor compression systems. But as everyone knows that they need electricity, so um we need to produce more electricity uh, they have also leaks and they may lead to ozone depletion and global warming so alternative uh, our uh, this this uh, topics motivate our groups to work on other uh, technologies and uh, other alternative cooling technologies uh, specifically work on the absorption systems and as you can see in absorption systems we use a binary mixture to produce uh, cooling and uh, produce cooling. And as you can see, uh, it, there usually be a pair of, pair of, uh, pair of mixture, which is uh, contains of coolant and absorbent. Absorbent is, uh, coolant is responsible to produce our, our cooling and absorbent is uh, somehow going to deliver the uh, delivering the cooling medium to somewhere and then absorb it from somewhere else and as you can see 
the conventional absorption system consists of, consist of several parts and uh, there might be some pumps uh, and spray objects in uh, our uh, in, in absorption system but um, which will increase the uh, maintenance and cost uh, also uh, um, we, we also need uh, electricity to run them to overdo this problem uh, we use a novel uh, layout of absorption uh, systems which is called diffusion absorption refrigeration system which there is no moving part and it can be totally run but with thermal energy um, as you can see uh, it can, uh, consists of several parts uh, the main the heart of our system is called uh, bubble pump which is responsible to um, use a buoyancy and uh, buoyancy phenomena to pump the refrigerant to the top and um, uh, somehow um, after after uh, going uh, going top uh, the, in in the condensed uh, condense, uh, in the rectifier our refrigerant and coolant is going to, uh, our coolant and absorbent is going to spread from each other at this point and refrigerant go to condenser in condenser they are going to condense and turn into the uh, liquid and that liquid is going to be further subcooled and get into the um, evaporator in evaporator there is a uh, auxiliary gas uh, it's mostly hydrogen helium or and other noble gases, uh, but it's mostly hydrogen. And the interaction between hydrogen and ammonia evaporation uh, leads to a partial pressure drop, and it produces a huge amount of, uh, it really, uh, you know, a huge amount of uh, drop in temperature uh, occurs in this point, in this point, in point nine. And then uh, that the resulting evaporated ammonia and, um, hydrogen goes to the absorber and from other side the absorbent which is in term of liquid going to pour into the absorber as well uh, the ammonia hydrogen gas is going to meet the absorber which which is mostly water absorber in in the uh, absorbent in absorber coil and ammonia diffuse into the water and then the cycle would be a repeat this is how how the system is worked but what we are going to do in our group is going uh, is going to somehow uh, to make it affordable to work with solar energy uh, and um, solar energy are mounted in the decentralized areas arid areas where there is no chance of expanding grids or um, you know there are not educated people who can deal with the complex you know cooling systems and um, and as you can see their the system uh, the diffusion absorption systems are mostly has low there is some drawbacks they have low COPs uh, by the way uh, to be fair to compare with other technology we should know that they can be totally driven by thermal energy so may, which make it really really uh, comfortable to work with solar thermal uh, collectors in our group we draw uh, we uh, set up uh, experimental facilities to uh, first of all uh, check what, what would be the thermodynamical aspects of a DAR unit uh, of a diffusion absorption refrigeration unit or an acronym DAR and uh, we try to somehow find the best properties for each DAR we, uh, we try to somehow adjust the parameters uh, we try to uh, consider any ambient uh, ambient temperature we also uh, which lead to uh, building uh, this Field experiment solar DAR unit, which uh, is totally driven by solar thermal collectors, and um, we try, uh, we study the possibility of using such a system uh, by a you know uh, optimum uh, parameters, which can be you know mixture uh, concentration, uh, pressure, uh, input power, uh, to see if the system is feasible to work with. Uh, it, if the system feasible to work with solar thermal um, interfaces and in the uh, in another stage we try to compare uh, this uh, this solar uh, solar um, thermal dar system with a uh, uh, vapor compression system when both are totally driven with uh, thermal uh, with uh, solar energy but for dar system the solar energy turned into the uh, heat but for vapor compression system 
it's going to turn into electricity. And uh, uh, we consider different layouts. Uh, for example, that sometimes uh, try to use the AR system to produce ice or direct cooling our space. And uh, we uh, saw the performance of the system. Also, we consider the vapor compressor system in, in different uh, uh, scenarios to see if um, you know to make a fair comparison uh, comparison between the VCR system and the AR our DAR system, solar DAR system. And at the end, we realized that okay, uh, at uh, also the DAR system might be bigger than VC, uh, vapor compression systems, but uh, they have low levelized cost of energy, levelized cost of cooling actually, so they can produce cooling in low, lower cost. Um, so at least our system is profitable. So after that, we decided to somehow uh, increase our performance in producing ice. So we try to consider other type of uh, uh, solar modules and couple it with our system to see if everything uh, can perfectly work or not. And we also want a grant to uh, test our system in Egypt. Uh, the system layout is uh, supposed to be look like this one. Uh, as you can see, uh, there is a parabolic uh, solar collectors connected to this uh, to the DAR system, and this DAR system is going to produce us uh, sufficient ice. Um, this is uh, I, I try to somehow uh, give my research project in in brief to uh, any other. And at the end, I want to thank you, my colleagues, uh, professor uh, colleagues, and my supervisor, Professor Kirstis Marquides, Asma Haraz, and also my colleagues in uh, Solar Polar LTD, Robert Edwards and Michael Raids, also uh, Islamic Development Bank and Newton, uh, Newton Musharrafa Fund, also Engineering Without Border, uh, Borders of USI for funding the project. Um, and uh, I'm ready to answer your question if you have any. Okay, thank you very much, Ahmed. So as we, we do have a few moments for questions, so if you do have one, please type it into the questions box on the GoToWebinar portal. Uh, while okay. I'll give you a moment on that, uh, let me remind you that this is one of a series of ICME Global Awards webinars taking place throughout November. If you'd like to find out more about what's still to come, visit our website, ikme.org forward slash global awards. That's ikme.org forward slash global awards. Uh, we don't appear to have any questions for you, Ahmed, so thank you very much. We'll move on to our second finalist. Now, this one is a pre-recorded video from Sula Keliki from London South Bank University. Research Nano Today lab focuses on designing and engineering advanced functional materials using a target-oriented approach in providing solutions to major global challenges in water treatment, environmental energy storage, and biomedical related areas. Energy storage, wireless communications, battery cleaning processes, environmental, enhanced oil recovery. 2D materials exhibit a wealth of remarkable properties, including high surface area, mechanical properties, chemical stability, and quantum confinement. The challenge is how we can make the 2D materials in a large scale production. Continuous hydrothermal flow synthesis uses water at supercritical conditions and involves mixing of water at critical conditions with relevant precursors. The portfolio of materials synthesized by a CHFS include uh, various nano 2D composites from graphene, maxine, boronitride, silver graphene with antibacterial properties, as well as modifying the surface of graphene with metal oxide to provide uh, catalyst materials for CO2 utilization. Continuous hydrothermal flow synthesis offers a variety of control of parameters, so with temperature, pressure, 
and uh, tunability of flow rate, tunability of residence time, and consequently the processes that uh, the synthetic processes that are done in lengthy period of time in CHFS, this has been delivered within fraction of second. An increase in the energy demand of a fast growing world population is one of the challenges faced by the energy industry today. Technological advances in wearable electronics and the ever growing presence of the Internet of Things has increased demand for high performance flexible antenna. One of the biggest challenges of this century is to provide sustainable and affordable potable water. The optimized conversion or renewable biomass and was related component into useful carbon-based nanomaterial is one of the biggest challenges for sustainable world. Cover more oil from the reservoir, we use enhancer, but the conventional enhancer are way too expensive and can cause a huge environmental damage. My project aims to make CHFS derived materials with tunable and optimized properties to obtain high performance capacity charge storage properties such as high energy and power density as well as psychic stability. Conductive 2D materials are potentially revolutionary antenna materials allowing for ultra-thin and flexible antennas not possible with current antenna materials. My work involves synthesizing and characterizing novel 2D materials including maxine and graphene composites and implementing these materials in designs for flexible antennas. In our group, we are developing and testing membranes using 2D materials such as graphene and graphene derivatives for water treatment processes. The aim of the research is design and engineer carbon quantum dust from biomass with excellent optical and structural properties by using continuous hydrothermal process. Uh, this new clean, rapid single step continuous hydrothermal process will create a new approaches for synthesizing carbon quantum dust. My project is to using carbon quantum dust derived from sugar, which is a clean and uh, cheap resource as an enhancer to produce more oil from the reservoir. To achieve this, I studied the impact of carbon quantum dust on oil water property and send them through the co-flooding system to see the actual oil uh, additional oil recovery. Nano two. Okay, uh, that was a video from London South Bank University. Obviously, they're not with us here live, so there's no Q and A on this one. It's now time for our third presenter, and this one is with us live. So representing the joint entry from the US National Energy Technology Laboratory and West Virginia University, please welcome Dushant Shekawat. Okay, thank you. Can you see my screen? Uh, at the you... moment, you can just see your Outlook folder. Um, so you just need to see the PowerPoint. Okay, how about now? Uh, yes, and if you just put it into presenter view and then switch the display settings. I don't know. Uh, at the top left, you'll see the display settings and you can choose to swap from the drop down. Okay, what is it? 
Yeah. So at the top left of your screen, it says show taskbar, and then next to that, display settings. Display settings, okay. okay. And then if you just choose to swap presenter view. Okay. And that's perfect. Okay. Okay, so good morning again. And this is, uh, uh, of course, you know, attendees from Americas and uh, good afternoon for others. Again, my name is Vishyam Chetout, and uh, I am from US Department of Energy's National Energy Technology Lab, uh, Morgantown, West Virginia. And uh, before I talk about my project, uh, uh, microwave assisted ammonia synthesis, I'd like to discuss briefly about uh, my organization. Okay. Okay, I'm sure you are familiar with the U.S. Department of Energy's national lab systems. Uh, there are 17 national labs affiliated, affiliated with the DOE, and my organization, NETL, is one of those. And uh, so, yeah, and uh, it's kind of, a, this is only lab uh, under the DOE system that is affiliate, you know, does research about fossil energy. And so, therefore, the goal of, uh, you know, the mission of my lab is uh, uh, discover, integrate, and mature technology solution to enhance the nation's energy foundation and protect the environment for future generations. So there, there are five locations, you know, the you know, same arrangement, but there are five locations spread over the country, and uh, main locations, research locations are in uh, Oregon, Al Albany, Oregon, Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Morgantown, West Virginia, where I am from. So yes, kind of a different kind of a focus for different sites, but overall, you know, just a kind of a, a complementing each other's efforts, you know. So, so yeah, so there's also there are two um, field offices. But the offices, you know, that those are located in Alaska and Texas. Those are strategically like you know in the like in you know, oil and gas area, you know. Okay. So uh, research, you know, at NETL is conducted in five different, you know, there are four, five core competencies. I'm not going into detail, but uh, like, you know, name suggested, one is computational science and engineering, you know, conducting applied scientific and research, you know, for physics-based simulation models, materials engineering and manufacturing, doing mostly like, you know, like, you know, developing uh, materials for structural, like, you know, high, temperature boilers or functional material like uh, for catalysis for reaction systems or something, uh, geological and environmental systems, uh, uh, like uh, doing, you know, subsurface kind of research, like, you know, CO2 sequestration and that kind of stuff, and also like breaking in that, you know, yeah. I myself is an energy conversion engineering. That is for, you know, doing research for reactor design and reaction engineering for, you know, for fuel conversion. And also, of course, doing uh, system analysis and, you know, for, you know, that means, you know, doing techno-economic assessment for the processes we are working on. The la last one you see the program education integration, then because we are national lab, you know, we are part of Department of Energy, so we have also one function to kind of fund a uh, project externally, you know, so like a high TR or high maturation, we go do research, we go to a commercialization scale or something like that, then we just uh, go outside and fund it, you know, academics or, you know, you know or smaller companies or whoever can do, like, take it to for the commercialization. Okay. About my, what, about my project? What was the goal? What was the objective? My objective was to produce ammonia uh, uh, from microwave-assisted process from standard resources at low temperature and near ambient pressure. So, yeah, so, you know, ammonia is, I'm not saying, of course, fertilizer is a big use for that, but Department of Energy is exploring this one as a carbon neutral liquid fuel. So, like, you know, just there is like, you know, in the you know, western part of the US or, you know, southern part of the US, there are a lot of renewable energies available. This was, but those are distributed. So how do you kind of utilize efficiently those? So they believe, you know, we believe 
that ammonia could be used as a carbon neutral liquid fuel to store those uh, distri that distributed energy. Okay. But why microwave? Why would you use microwave to produce uh, ammonia? Uh, so I'm pretty sure everyone is familiar with that. This Haber-Bosch process was invented, I think, almost 110 years ago. You know, and since it was kind of invented, more or less, did not change much. You know, just like you know, oh, high temperature around 400 degrees C, extremely high pressure, 300 bar, and and uh, the same, they're pretty much similar catalyst, iron based catalyst. And then, uh, you know, so you know I, that doesn't mean you know, a lot of you know research did not work in this area. A lot of researchers worked in the area, but in the steam world, you know, just to implement or kind of you know, in, in, you know, the technology won't be able to penetrate in the market if you don't show the uh, state change. And because you know, there are not that significant change, and you know what could provide the state change? What could we believe microwave can provide that state change that industry is looking for in this, this area? And we were able to do it. You know, we will show you some slides. Okay, so so particularly what are some of those attributes of microwave? Those could be utilized to fill the you know to make it this a transportive techno transformative technology. One. Microwave, you know, just this, you know, everything. I mean, you know about this thing. Microwave can selective heat the material. So, for example, like you know, this catalyst. You know, you you're looking for you know for ammonia synthesis. You have two, you know, mainly two steps. You can say that you know, uh, one uh, is uh, nitrogen or hydrogen activation that needs higher energy. Okay, and uh, uh, the subsequent steps are like you know, NH bond formation. You, 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 that has those are exothermic steps, and you need you know lower temperature profile or something like that. Traditional catalysis, you don't have option. The temperature would be the same for the whole uh, catalyst path. But by in, at least idealistically, we can say that we can provide you know we can design the material as it is. Like you know we can have those highly active sites where nitrogen dissociation is occurring at high you know high uh, temperature sites. Okay, and wherever the uh, like you know, subsequent steps, where would be the exothermic steps, the, you know, where the reaction would be, you know, the uh, subsequent reaction might be happening, those could be cooler, you know, relatively cooler, I should say that, you know. So, you know, but that, that is not possible, the conventional method. But we will, you know, for microwave, you know, you can create the temperature gradient, gradient to get in the catalyst system according to the mechanistic needs. That and, and and that how that can be done? That can be done by you know tailoring the material properties as well as microwave parameters such as frequency, pulsing, and the power. And because that is not possible in conventional method. Okay, by doing this, we were able to kind of uh, produce. I'll show the results next slide. At a low temperature, around 280 or 300 degrees C, and almost near ambient pressure. You know, we produce ammonia. You know that temperature is okay, and so this is a kind of idealistic for those standard resources, like you know renewable resources, because they, you know uh, because this can be modular, okay, and and also particularly you know it could be rapid startup and shutdown. You know we did this is a kind of you know this is I'm showing only three days run, but you know we did eight days. We were able to kind of stop the reaction at the end of the day and start next morning. It would come up within five minutes. Five minutes, you know, the we were able to get the steady state results with the, where we stopped at the previous night, previous night. So, you know, eight days, nothing changed. You know, this is kind of fast, rapid startup and shutdown. That is a possible only in this particular thing. And th that cannot be done, you know, the, the traditional uh, economy of scale, haber bass process. That is, you know, for people to have a kind of uh you know, economically favorable we have to have a pretty large scale in that traditional but this one we can do it okay so idealistically what you can do that you can cup you know you can it can be coupled with those inter intermittent energy resources like green electrons from uh 
uh, the sources like you know wind or you know solar are available and those you know but those are like and i said before those are distributed uh, you know in, in uh, you know and so this modular process can be installed at those remote locations and and can be kind of a and can be you know uh, efficiently store those electrons and in the forms of you know ammonia and you know of course you know it can be used in fertilizer and also in as a medium for is like a carbon neutral liquid fuel and uh, that can be stored transported easily wherever is needed so so like you know uh, there is like i said before there is a critical need for breakthrough technology and that increases the efficiency of energy use and and, it, and that make possible uh, intermittent energy resources you couple with that you know and because of the, all those attributes we believe microwave catalysis technology has a potential not only for ammonia synthesis but advanced you know can be become you know next frontier next frontier of science in the chemical process industry okay and uh, so what we are doing this uh, this kind of uh, this uh, at this point we are you know catalysts you know, we know the catalyst but that is in the uh, uh, you know, some kind of powder form to make it commercialization to have you know to commercialize that technology it has to be uh, some kind of a, uh, a commercial form like you know monoliths or pallets or foams or something like that so we are working on that one and we are also working on scale up efforts like you know goal is to kind of you know you know this is goal is to like you know by end of this year you know one kilogram ammonia per day and we are pretty close to that you know we are we are, i think uh, uh, we should be able to show like in even this month that for much production after that you know like we are research lab go beyond that scale we are talking to some external companies you know and they are pretty much interested uh, to license our technology so they would be able to take this technology to the next level to the pilot scale and you know all those things so that would happen sometimes next year so you know well, you know, at this point, you know, like you can see the right side of the, you know, uh, graph, the traditional hyperbars catalyst did not work in microwave, you know. So, you know, so we have to design the catalyst so according to microwave needs. And we use console modeling to understand how the geometry and surface interact with the microwaves. As well, we use a console kind of modeling to design the waveguide and the whatever that you know system microwave system to minimize uh, any you know microwave losses and or you can say optimize the you know we use you know the optimize the energy efficiency and that that's what we are using the council only so other than that you know just to, you know you might have seen you know a lot of papers uh, use the microwave technologies uh, uh, for chemical uh, conversion also you know just their plug but I call them majority of them, you know, uh, 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 the cooking, you know, so the cooking papers. That means, you know, they are saying, okay, selectivity will increase, it will, it will be increased, or whatever that. You know, catalyst is not designed according to microwave needs, but you know, NETL is taking steps to explain the phenomena. So, to, so we have like, you know, some unique facility to understand the phenomena. We are, you know, use uh, taking advantage of power of uh, uh, what we call modeling. To understand the you know microwave interactions with the material or you know to design all those things and also kind of have diagnostic tools to to, to explain the phenomena so that, that, that and also we have like unique systems here to system that i don't think so any other labs would have that kind of thing okay like you know one you know unique system is a high pressure microwave here to mostly you know available in this kind of a as uh, those are continuous air you know, continuous air system. Uh, so there's mostly use at ambient pressure. Out there, microwave air system, if needed, would go to high pressures. Not high that is needed for the 300 bars of time because we don't need that. But if we need it, we can go up to 500 psig. Uh, and uh, other thing is a variable frequency microwave air system that can use, you know. If, you know, traditional reactor system or you know your domestic microwaves are 2.45 gigahertz, but that, that doesn't mean you know your reactor would have optimal interaction at that particular frequency. So we have one variable, you know, uh, reactor system that could go 2 to 8 gigahertz. So we we kind of analyze our samples 
you know, cat catalysis for micro, you know, ammonia or whatever the case systems we are working on in uh, some network analyzer to find where the uh, where's the optimal interaction uh, frequency, and then we can we can perform the reaction at the particular uh, particular frequency in the reactor system. So you know, we have all those kind of that's the thing. You know, we want to kind of uh, have, you know, just to understand because we don't understand the fundamentals. It's pretty, pretty difficult to make this system in, in a efficient as well as a uh, uh, kind of a, a viable, economically viable. So, at this, if did this, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, my colleague from West Virginia University. He was a PI of this project too, and uh, Professor Zan Hu and his team at the university that, that is also located in Morgantown. And also my colleague, uh, Dr. Christina Wildfire from NETL, my same, my same organization. And also Department of Energy's RPIE program for supporting this uh, particular project. And also kind of acknowledge the institution of chemical engineers to kind of giving me this opportunity to speak in front of, you know, to know research around from the, around the world. Thank you very much. If you have any questions or comments, let me know. Thank you. Uh, we have time for questions. So if you have one, please type it into the questions box on the GoToWebinar portal. Uh, whilst we have a moment and wait for those, I'd like to thank our volunteer judging panel, led by head judge Keith Batchelor. The judges have worked tirelessly, volunteering their time to review and score every entry. You can find out more about the judging panel on the ICME Global Awards web pages. So we don't appear to have any questions. So thank you. We will move on to our next presenter. And thank you. representing Petronas Research, it's Badli Hadana. Hello, can you hear my voice? Yes, we can, and we can see your slides. We just need to put them into the uh, presentation view and we'll be ready to go. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Can I start now? Yes, please okay. do. Okay, uh, thank you very much, organizer, for arranging this uh, ICME Global Awards for 2020. So, unfortunately, in Malaysia, currently it's already 10 40 p.m. So but a bit challenging for us in Malaysia. Uh, okay, uh, for this presentation, I have uh, several slides, maybe about seven to eight minutes, and then we'll be followed by um, a montage video after after this presentation. So is it okay? All right. Uh, so the the title of my presentation today is about uh, crime in technology. It's a world first uh, high gravity technology for ultra high CO2 separation from natural gas, uh, presented for ICAMI Global Awards 2020 under research project category. In this project, uh, we have uh, collaborative partners uh, from China as well, uh, uh, Beijing University of Technology, BUCT, uh, to do uh, this kind of uh, fabrication and testing. So, um, so this is high CO2 fields around the world. So as you might aware, um, we have several uh, high, high CO2 uh, natural gas fields around the world uh, indicated at the blue dot. To unlock these uh, recovery forces, we need a technology that is sustainable for future and has minimal impact to the climate change. So the ob objective of my presentation is to present uh, as part of this uh, ICAMI Global Awards uh, award submission. Uh, we have some several problem statements in here, like a massive footprint for conventional cryogenic distillation, uh, higher weight due to tall column, uh, packing material normally as a standard steel uh, for this application, and also a structure, uh, a weight, uh, heavy structure. Uh, due to this, uh, we need a higher capex, capital expenditure for investment, uh, especially for offshore application. And then uh, we have some sustainability, sustainability issue uh, due to the CO2 production and storage. Okay, so we have this uh, scrimming technology currently uh, in Petronas. 
Crimine is a bulk CO2 separation technology, mainly to separate high CO2 from 80 mole percent down to 20 mole percent. It utilizes a high gravity concept uh, to improve mass transfer and heat transfer in the column. Thus, it will reduce the packing volume, uh, the column height, and also column weight. Uh, in total, it will also reduce the capex for overall G AGRU system, acid gas removal system. And then the CO2, CO2 outlet of the product from crimine will be in liquid form at high pressure. Thus, is easier for the reinjection back to the reservoir. So this is high gravity concept uh, of process intensification technology. Uh, you may see uh, the feed gas coming from the left side. It will be uh, two phase, uh, liquid and uh, vapor. So the liquid will go to the middle of the column and then will be have some mass transfer to the packing and then goes to the reboiler. Uh, while the vapor will go up to the um, cells, get out, cells get outlet and we are targeting uh, the CO2 outlet at the top products about 20% more. While at the bottom outlet, uh, mostly pure CO2, about 99%, with less hydrocarbon loss. Okay, um, so in this um, technology, we are combining a cryogenic distillation technology and also the high gravity technology. It becomes a crimine. The intention is to reduce the uh, column height uh, by 50%, column weight by 30%, and also capex reduction uh, as our research target is about 30% uh, reduction. Next slide. Okay, uh, this is just to show you the comparison uh, of high gravity technology as compared with conventional tower. As you might see on right hand side, it's an uh, original absorption tower. Uh, the column height about 30, 33 meters, uh, 1.2 meters diameters, as compared with 1.2 meters of diameters and 1.42 meters of column height. It performs a similar uh, flow, feed gas flow rate for both of the column, but it will reduce tremendously the column height and column, uh, column uh, weight. Okay, just want to show on the technology development journey. Uh, we have the ideation of this uh, uh, high gravity back in 2013 uh, for the rotating, uh, rotating bed. And then uh, two years later, we have a thermodynamic validation uh, by using uh, PVT and also hybrid uh, kinetics uh, equipment. And then uh, two years later, we have some uh, proof of concept by uh, using um, um, CFD to have some modeling and also on the hydrodynamic studies and uh, we have built the first prototype uh, back in 2018 uh, the first prototype and then tested with uh, binary gas uh, CO2 and methane and then uh, successfully complete, uh, completed and tested uh, this prototype and next on the upscaling at offshore condition and uh, ready for commercialization in 2020. So uh, this is a climbing prototype that we have uh, in the 3D model uh, and also some PFD. I may need to skip this one. So for installation and commissioning, uh, we have this uh, skid uh, at the left hand side. Um, and then during the installation, we have some um, insulation. The right hand side is before installation. The middle pictures is insulation uh, with ultra low um, insulation. And uh, the top right is the column uh, during testing. Okay, on the separation performance, uh, we have um, figure one showing the methane uh, mole percent. Uh, and on the right hand side is the CO2 mole percent during the 24 hours um, testing for durability testing. The feed gas coming about 30% uh, of methane and also 80% uh, of 70% uh, uh, of feed, uh, CO2. And then the sales gas, our target about 70%, sorry, 80% to 70% of methane. And the uh, uh, hydrocarbon loss at the bottom about uh, 1 or 2%.
Okay, um, um, our uh, testing and then uh, we have um, performed this uh, separation performance is in line with the thermodynamics VLE prediction. So uh, this is the bottom product, the green uh, box, and then the top product is uh, on the red dot. So um, the target is to get um, more than 80% 80, 80 of uh, methane at the um, top product and also less than 2% um, methane at the, at the, um, um, the CO2 bottom product. So it still uh, have some gaps between the the CO2 solid line, this red line. So after the AGR, you separated the CO2 by using this cremin, all the CO2 molecule will be injected back to reservoir. And then uh, this is to address also the issue of the sustainability. And this is also in line with the Petronas aspiration to achieve the zero carbon emission by 2050. So in conclusion, uh, climate technology is proven for bulk CO2 removal from natural gas. The research took uh, many years from ideation to into 2013 to pilot plan. It involves many engineering disciplines, uh, process, mechanical, instrument, structural, and etc. cetera. Uh, the climate technology reduced uh, capex to unlock the hydrocarbon potential from high CO2 fields around the world. CO2 produced from climate will be in liquid form, uh, thus enabling the more economical uh, CO2 reinjection back to reservoir for storage. And in line with Petronas' aspiration to achieve z net zero carbon emission by 2050. Okay, maybe that's all my presentation. What time now? So I have some, some uh, video. And in here, so I may share some screen. The world is now faced with an utmost challenge. Climate change is causing temperatures to rise tremendously. To unlock these hydrocarbon resources, we need a technology that is sustainable for future and has a minimum impact to climate change. Conventional distillation column, normally associated with large footprint, high weight and ultimately high capex, hence not suitable for offshore application. Crimean is a CO2 separation technology that utilizes high gravity. It improves mass transfer and heat transfer in the column, thus reducing column height, column weight, and ultimately reducing the capex. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, that's all. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for staying with us late into your evening to be part of the session. So if we do have a moment now for questions. So if you do have any questions, please type them into the questions box on the GoToWebinar portal. We'll just pause for a moment.
Right, I don't think we've got any questions, so thank you, Fadley, and we will move on to our next finalist uh, from Promethean Particles. Please welcome Selena Ambrose. Hi everyone, uh, so I should be sharing my screen, so hopefully you can all see that. Um, so yes, thank you very much, Matt. Um, so um, yes, I'm Selena Ambrose, I'm the technical manager here at Promethean Particles, and um, we were part of a, uh, a collaborative project uh, titled iSmart, so that's what I'll be talking about uh, today. So I'll be representing Promethean and the seven other partners in the iSmart project consortium. So firstly, uh, just to give a, a bit of introduction as to who Promethean Particles are, to give the audience some context uh, as to our role in the project. So um, we're based in Nottingham in the UK, but we operate, operate globally. Um, and uh, quite simply, we design, develop and deliver um, nanomaterial dispersions. Uh, and we do this using our patented continuous flow technology. Um, so this is actually very similar to one of the other finalists, um, the, the process they use. So continuous flow hydrothermal synthesis of nanomaterials. Um, and using uh, this is a wet chemical process, which offers a lot of um, uh, product and process benefits uh, from a health and safety point of view, but also uh, reducing the risk of particle particle agglomeration um, and, and downstream benefits for the products. So we're very proud to say that we have the largest uh, reactor system of its kind in the world uh, based here at our site in Nottingham and that's what's pictured um, in the slide there. So this uh, system has the capacity to produce in excess of a thousand tons per year dry weight equivalent of, of nanomaterials. So um, anything we develop on the small scale, we're very confident that we can scale up production and meet industrial demand or commercial demand. And we also have the flexibility to offer our customers um, contract development of uh, bespoke nanomaterials uh, so that they're fit for purpose and, and meet the requirements of the application. Um, and we do this by our feasibility studies, and then that could lead to um, contract manufacturing of larger volumes on our customers' behalf. So on to the, the project itself. iSmart, um, um, the long name for this project was uh, the Durable Ice Repellent Coating Process for Aerospace and Energy Industries. And as that title suggests, the project aimed to develop um, uh, resin coatings that contained uh, multifunctional nanoparticle additives that would make the coating itself highly repellent to water and ice. And this technology that we developed or uh, was primarily aimed at the aerospace coatings market. So why, why, why this project? What's the motivation for uh, developing a uh, water and ice repellent coating? Well, in aerospace, as you can see from the picture there, ice formation in, on aircraft is a significant problem globally. The ice buildup can lead to uh, increasing the weight of the, the craft, uh, causing increased drag and uh, in turn increases the fuel consumption of the plane. And then the ice buildup itself can lead to fatal crashes um, and also accidents through shedding of the ice. And at the moment, the uh, ways of pre preventing ice formation is um, either mechanical breaking of the ice, uh, electrical heating of the leading edges or the panels on the craft, or using uh, large volumes of de-icing fluid to, to spray the aircraft as, as the uh, bottom image shows there. Now this, the spraying with uh, de-icing fluid isn't great either because after the aircraft has been sprayed, there's a, a, a window, um, a finite time when the craft can then take off and take to the skies um, while the fluid is still active. And this typically um, is about 30 to 60 minutes, depending on the weather conditions and is known as the holdover time. So the pilot has this um, finite time before um, the, the coating kind of comes off and uh, the craft needs to be sprayed again if that window is missed. So ultimately, 
Um, this ice formation, this ice buildup is uh, give, leads to a huge financial cost, uh, plus the the um, the drag increase and the fuel consumption leading to higher carbon emissions means that there's a huge environmental cost as well. So clearly this uh, calls for a solution. So within the IceMark project, um, as, a, as a consortium, we aim to develop a novel passive ice repellent coating uh, that could be um, put onto the, the leading edges or the panels of the craft um, as part of construction so that um, during the lifetime of the airplane, um, it would prevent ice formation uh, and adhesion and uh, there wouldn't be the need for active ice management. So in the project, we had um, eight partners all together um, across academia and research organizations through to SMEs um, and also included multinational companies spanning the whole value chain. So at the, the kind of start of the supply chain, uh, ourselves at Promethean Particles, along with the Welding Institute, TWI, we worked on the development, production and upscaling of the functional nanoparticle additives. So these were mainly based around silicon nanoparticles that were functionalized to um, give them hydrophobic properties. Then these particles were passed to um, our partners at London South Bank University and PPG uh, to formulate the particles into the resin coatings, then apply them onto the panels. Um, and then uh, CAV uh, advanced Technologies, GKN Aerospace and BAE Systems um, led the work on the ice adhesion testing and then the whole project was supported by our partners Opus Materials Technologies um, uh, and they focused on the marketing uh, of the technology as well as project, uh, project dissemination. So this project was uh, in part funded by Innovate UK and uh, we had a total budget of about 1.1 million pounds and it spanned over two years uh, and the IceMark project finished uh, early last year. So um, our partners at Opus were um, worked on dissemination of, of the project and as well as that, they looked at um, other um, markets or other applications where anti-icing coatings could be relevant. And throughout the project it became clear that though we were primarily looking at the aerospace industry um, it, there are a lot of um, markets that could do with a, a passive um, ice repellent coating so for example wind turbines ice formation on wind turbines can lead to huge inefficiencies as well as in uh, the marine sector so ice formation on, on marine vessels can lead them to become hugely uh, unstable, which uh, can lead to fatal accidents. Um, ice formation on power lines could uh, knock out the power to, to buildings. And then also on high rise buildings, um, ice formation at great heights um, can lead to the, the ice being shed as uh, temperatures warm up and uh, which isn't a great um, case for pedestrians or anyone lower down. And then right through to um, the, the leisure industry. So winter sports, skiing, snowboarding, um, ice formation can be a huge problem here. So this just reiterates the need for an anti-icing coating that and reiterates the need for or the motivation for the work we did within iSmart. So unfortunately today, um, I don't have the time to go into huge details about um, what we did in the project, but um, we, uh, we, we've we um, got a lot of really good dissemination material um, that explains about the, the project and what we did. There's some great um, short explainer videos on Vimeo. So there's a link here to, um, to access those. There's a project website as well as so social media channels as well. So if you want to find out more about the work we did within iSmart, then please visit these, these links here. And then to sum things up, I'll just give a quick summary of where we are with this work. So within iSmart, um, this two year project, we increased the technology readiness level or TRL to about four or five. Um, we um, are now very fortunate to be continuing this work. Uh, Innovate UK have uh, seen the, the need for this technology and to bring it to commercialization. So um, we've been very lucky and very fortunate to um, 
be granted a funding to, for a follow-up project. This is called ISLIP. Um, and so in this project, we're looking to upscale the production of these functional nanoparticle additives and coatings and uh, increase the TRL further. So we have much of the same partners involved. Um, uh, CAV uh, are leading the project again, and we've brought in a new partner in Vitec to look at the computational fluid dynamic uh, modeling aspect of ice adhesion to, to really bring uh, increase the impact of, of what we're doing. This project is now active and runs until March 2022. So with that, I'd like to thank, um, thank IHME, uh, thank Innovate UK for, for the funding. I'd like to thank um, all of our partners, our project partners within iSmart and all of you in the audience for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Selena. So we have once again a few moments for questions. If you have a question for Selena, about her project, please type it into the questions box on the GoToWebinar portal. We'll pause for a moment to see if we have any questions. And whilst we wait, if you have been suitably inspired to submit your own entry to next year's ICME's Global Awards, keep an eye on our website for entry details. We typically open for entries at the start of March each year, so head on over to ICME.org forward slash global awards for more details on that. Uh, we don't appear to have any questions, Selena, so thank you very much. And we'll Thanks. move on with our next finalist. So next up, representing Saudi Aramco, please welcome Tao Chen. Right, Tal, we can't actually hear you at the moment, although you do appear to be unmuted. Um, just try again, if you would. No, we still can't hear you. We could see your screen, but we can't hear you. Uh, no, we, we can't hear you. Right, nothing at the moment. Gareth, Hello, is can you hear me? Oh, there Hello? we go. Now we can hear you. Okay. Loud and clear. Okay, so can you see my screen? Uh, we could, but now we can't. If you could share it again. There we okay, go. Okay, can you see? Okay, that's great. Uh, good, afternoon, good, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm Tao Chen. I'm working in uh, XBAC Advanced Research Center in Saudi Aramco. And today I will introduce the development of a non acidic multifunctional and sulfide scale dissolver. This development is, uh, this product is specially developed to remove the unsulfide deposit as a downhole completion tubing at depths up to about 10,000 feet underground in the oil and gas industry. And this product also can be applied for other industries suffered from the unsulfide deposition. Uh, today I will introduce the, the three aspects of this product from the background lab development field application, and finally I will draw the conclusions. Unsulfide scale deposition, downhole deposition is one of the major flow assurance issues appearance in the oil and gas industry. When the N2 plus reacts with H2S and it can deposit solid unsulfide in the downhole completion tubing. In sour oil and gas wells, there are plenty of the H2S. There are two major sources for H2S. There's one from thermal biodegradation the other from the XRB, the surface reducing bacteria. And for the N2 plus, it's a major from the chlorine. 
For the server wells, that's a production environment is highly corrosive due to the high temperature pressure, total dissolved solid, high CO2 and H2S. The downhole completion tubing uh, are normally uh, made in the mid uh, in carbon steel. When the produced water contacts the carbon steel and uh, completion tubing, it can gen it, it can release the N2 plus due to corrosion. When this N2 plus mixed with H2S, it can form the N sulfide deposit immediately, uh, even at a very low concentration. So over the time, the iron sulfide can deposit a thick layer, uh, iron sulfide can deposit in the downhole completion tubing, and the thickness can up to about half inch to one inch. When it formed, it can block the tubing, cause the wire intervention problem, reduce the production. Also, it could cause the under deposit pitting corrosion. This can penetrate the completion tubing and damage the, the tubing. So different from some conventional scale like the calcium carbonate and the barium sulfate scale. Iron sulfate scale that is much more complex. It has uh, many different morphologies, uh, uh, like this show that there are seven different morphology from the iron sulfate to the pyrite. The ratio of the iron and the sulfate are different. And uh, also the uh, solubility of this uh, uh, different morphology are totally different. For example, pyrotite can be dissolved in the high strong acid like HCl, but pyrite, they cannot be dissolved in the HCl. In our sour oil and gas well, we found the iron sulfate and the major steel deposit in downhole completion tubing. Uh, also, the iron sulfate are composed of the many different type, many different types of the uh, morphology of iron sulfide from the like the pyrotite, chalite, uh, martino white, and uh, pyrite. Like the, uh, all this make the system very complex and uh, very diff difficult to handle. So in our field, we observed iron sulfide deposition in the 1990s, and then we try to use the strong acid to remove the uh, iron sulfide. And there are two major uh, drawbacks for using the HCl. One is the HCl is the, uh, very corrosive. It could damage the completion tubing. The second is the HCl that uh, can generate H2S, a toxic gas, during the dissolution. So this brings the safety issues for the uh, dissolution. And then the treatment moved to the mechanical uh, uh, descaling, use the milling or jetting to remove the, the downhole uh, scale and surface scale in the downhole completion tubing. Uh, this method can remove the uh, scale, but uh, it's very expensive. For each uh, treatment, it costs about one to 1.5 million dollars. Also, it's uh, time consuming and uh, it normally takes uh, two to three weeks uh, to complete the job. This will cause the loss of the production. And then the treatment is moved back to find some of the chemical treatment. So uh, we use the TVTS and the Keyland based skill dissolver. This kind of dissolver works fine for the, some of the iron sulfide powder deposited in the surface facility. But for the thick layer of the deposit in the downhole, it's very difficult uh, to dissolve. Also, the reaction rate is very slow. So, so we continue to look for the more effective, more cost-effective, and more performance uh, uh, scale dissolvers. So this is the dissolver we have developed for the non-acidic multifunctional scale dissolver. This dissolver is based on the Kaland, is the Kaland based dissolver, and we have used the, add some of the actual additives like the pH controller and also some of the uh, oxidizer to change the dissolution uh, reaction route path of the dissolution. So we have run the, some of the tests to compare the performance of the dissolution. 
This D server and show the better performance than, than the other commercial chemi uh, available chemicals. Uh, the dissolution performance is uh, um, comparable, is uh, very close to the 15% of HCl. Also, the, one of the major benefits of this chemical is the very low cursive. Like the, especially compared with the HCl, we can see the difference of the cursivity. Uh, when we apply the chemical in the uh, field, the chemical could uh, be pumped or leaking into the formation. So we must make sure the chemical uh, will not generate any formation damage. We have run coffee test and uh, the top side is the cough uh, plug uh, before uh, the test and uh, the bottom uh, figure show the, the CT scan after the chemical treatment. We can see the wormhole form after the chemical treatment. That means this chemical will not cause any formation damage. Instead, it can stimulate the production. So after the successful lab development, we move this chemical to the field application. We have run um, um, several field successful applications in the gas well. This show one example. This, this fig, uh, photos show the water sampling before and uh, after the chemical treatment. Before the chemical treatment, we collect the water sample. That's a major, that's a colorless water sample. Uh, after the treatment, when the flowback stage of the scale is over, it's clearly see there's a lot of the black powder suspended in the flowback solutions. It's clearly show that uh, this chemical have effective, effectively removed the unsulfide deposit in the downhole tube. In addition, after the uh, treat treatment, the production increased, the gas production increased 44%, equivalent to about 2.85 million cubic feet uh, uh, gas per day. So we move to another case study for the deep uh, field trial in the sour oil wells. This is the caliper log before the, uh, bef this is a caliper log before the uh, treatment. We can see that's a dark color. It shows that there's some skill deposit at the downhole completion tube. After treatment, we can see the, how you, the completion tube is, uh, the color is much more uniform. That means they show that chemical have effectively removed the skill deposit there. Uh, for this well, that's a before uh, treatment, uh, it cannot produce there. And after treatment, uh, it's uh, fully recovered back to uh, full production. And uh, uh, based on their successful lab treatment, uh, lab development, and the field application, we can conclude that uh, this chemical has been successfully uh, developed and uh, applied in the field. That's uh, two major functions. One is uh, it can effectively remove the unsulfide deposit in the downhole tubing. The second is can stimulate the formation and improve the production. Compare the, with HCl, it uh, show has a good dissolving capacity. Also, it's a very low cursive and no H twice generation. Compared with the mechanical descaling, this treatment is a cost saving. It saved uh, about one million US dollars for per treatment. Also, it's a save time saving, and it, it, one treatment is the last two to day, three days instead of the two to three weeks for mechanical descaling. And uh, this chemical is under the patent USA patent application. Okay, uh, finally, uh, thanks for your attention. Okay. Thank you, Tao. Uh, it's time once again for Q&A. So if you have a question, uh, please add it into the questions box on the GoToWebinar portal. And we'll just pause for a moment. Okay, we don't appear to have any questions, so thank you. We'll move on to our next finalist. 
and representing the joint entry from Seren Technologies and Queen's University Belfast, I'd like to welcome Aideen McCourt and Peter Nockman. Okay, I think we are both on. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, I will just share my presentation. Okay, so good afternoon everyone. Um, my name is Aideen McCourt and I am the Process Development Chemist for CERN Technologies. I'm joined by Professor Peter Nockman from Queen's University Belfast and today we will talk you through our work in developing a sustainable rare earth separation process. So what are rare earth elements and why are they so important? Rare, rare earths are a group of 17 chemically similar elements that consist of the 15 lanthanides from lanthanum to lithium, plus scandium and yttrium. These elements play a vital role in several modern day applications, including um, our electronic devices, um, medical tools such as MRI scanners, um, and are fundamental to many of our green energy technologies. It has often been said rare earths are the vitamins required for the shift from a carbon-based economy to a new 21st century electric economy. As rare earths are key components to many of the technologies driving this shift, their demand uh, we can see has been rapidly increasing. The source of these rare earth elements uh, is combined with uh, a couple of uh, technological issues. So the mining as well as the recycling is um, very costly and has severe environmental issues uh, coming with it. One thing is that you use toxic chemicals to, uh, to leach these elements out of the earth. And then the next stage is the separation, which um, is a huge chemical challenge because you separate 17 elements from each other. And that means that while we have an increasing demand, uh, there are um, growing uh, environmental issues coming with this. Next slide, please. So the current issues uh, are very much around the uh, separation uh, methods. So uh, currently liquid-liquid uh, separations, so-called hydrometallurgy is used, and this relies basically on extractants and diluents. The diluents cause some issues because uh, these are usually uh, highly volatile, flammable diluents such as kerosene, and at the same time, these extractants are fairly poor in their selectivity to separate the metals into the different phases when these uh, are contacted. So that means you need, in order to separate these 17 elements, you require sometimes up to 1500 stages in the separation. At the same time, this consumes enormous amounts of power and produces toxic wastes and acid streams and so on. And that's a problem. So, yeah, next slide, please. Um, so our technology is uh, very much focusing on the separation. So we, we can, with our technology, uh, separate um, ores coming, or let's say rare earths coming from the mining and uh, uh, concentrated ores as well uh, can um, be applied to the recycling. So, and our vision is here to really develop a clean, sustainable separation process. Um, and um, we will show what we have developed in the next slide. Um, so our development is uh, very much um, based on ionic liquids. And these are um, by definition, uh, molten salts so, or salts which are liquid at room temperature and uh, they have an interesting feature because they have no uh, volatility or a negligible vapor pressure and pretty good stability but at the same time you can dissolve a, a range of compounds in these uh, solvents and their properties can be tuned by uh, composing uh, cation anion combinations. And uh, next slide, please. So 
the core of our technology is um, a very highly selective extractant so that uh, the chemical structure is uh, shown here on the right side that's a multifunctional amide functionalized ionic liquid sounds complicated but is actually quite easy to synthesize and this shows an extraordinary uh, uh, selectivity for these um, rare earth metals so uh, the so-called separation factors are uh, around 25 times higher than any commercial uh, uh, extractant currently and uh, so that means that if you contact the two phases um, it will selectively take out for example from a mixture of neodymium and dysprosium the neodymium out of this uh, aqueous phase and uh, this is a uh, already a granted patent that we have on this technology and um, uh, in the next slide we, we show how we take it from there. Um, so this, um, this uh, uh, technology has on the one hand uh, a very low capex opex, uh, it uh, is very cost efficient, uh, developed into a process, it uh, has very good scalability so uh, the, the current technology is basically a drop-in solution to uh, current um, technology and but at the same time we can go from around 13 to 1500 uh, stages of separation we can go down to something like 50 to 70 stages and that makes a huge difference on the costs of the whole process and uh, that or of course also has an impact on the environmental footprint so we need much less energy in the to run the process and uh, at the same time we don't produce uh, that amount of waste next yeah okay so this work began in queen's university belfast with the design of this novel extractant and here the first patent was filed CERN Technologies then obtained the exclusive license to further develop and scale up this process. During this time, they completed a full technical economic evaluation to ensure process feasibility. In 2018, CERN Technologies set up its first demonstration plant in the Wilton Centre, where they employed a team of two chemists and a chemical engineer to look at the process scale up. During this time, an additional four patents were filed and work began on the magnet and recycling uh, samples. We have worked alongside many mining companies, uh, magnet producers and allied ally companies from across the world. So as it stands, um, CERN Technologies has completed proof of concept for um, both the recycling and mining processes. Five patents have been filed and a full technical evaluation has been completed to ensure an economic viability. As we look to the future, we envisage the successful scale up of our recycling plant while also looking at the piloting of our, our mining separation. Of course, all of this would not be possible without a good team behind us. Um, our directors, Edward Morell and Thomas Bucknell, uh, Peter and Professor Martin Atkins, our research and development team in uh, CERN Technologies, um, Dr. Ina Bradley, um, Joe Instone and Esther McKee, and our research team in Queen's University, Belfast, uh, PhDs, Kieran Carroll, Anthony Dodd and Daryl Hinchcliffe. So that just leaves me um, to thank you all for listening, to thank the ICAMI for pushing on this uh, award show and um, any questions are welcomed. Thank you, Aideen and Peter. So once again, if you have a question, please use the questions box on the GoToWebinar portal. While we wait for that, just a quick reminder that the winner of this award automatically qualifies as a finalist for our top prize, the Outstanding Achievement in Chemical and Process Engineering Award. The winner of that one will be announced later this month. Okay, I don't think we have any questions, so we will move on. Thank you, Aideen and Peter. Thank and you. it's now time for the final presentation, and last but not least, representing UCL, it's Yun Wang Tang.
Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, good, good. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm later because I don't know how to download the software. It took me ages to download the software. Um, do you know how to share these um, slides? Um, I have slides here. Yeah, you should have received um, a prompt on your screen to share your screen. Uh, let, me, uh, let me share my screen. Uh, can I see that? Um, why is it share my screen? Uh, not this one. Um, which one is share my screen? Sharing. Uh, no, didn't see that one. Um, sorry, I don't know how to share that thing because I cannot find any. I'm going to let my colleague Gareth step in here because he understands the technology side um, of things. Yeah, so I've, I've just made you presenters, Yun Wang, so you should uh -huh. have you should have received a, a pop up on your screen. Uh, let me just do that again for you. Bear with me one second. You'll get a pop up on your screen that will say "Share my screen when ready." Um, so here, just uh, good way, I would like to capture your computer screen. Uh, right, so that should that should have come up on your screen now, asking you to show your screen. Okay, and uh, asking me to uh, oh, screen record. Is screen recording this one? Let me see if the screen recording works. Uh, screen recording. Um, yeah, look at in the system reference and. It should have been a pop up that overrode everything else on your screen. Yeah, I saw that one because uh, that's asking me to go to the preference. I uh, click this preference. I see the screen recording. And next, ask me to I was go to meeting. Is this one? Uh, I said probably need a um, good meeting. Will not be able to record the content of the screen until it's quit. Oh, I cannot quit this one. Uh, it's a bit funny. <laughs> no, not easy. Um, let me see if I can do this way. So screen shape. Okay. Now it should be okay. Um, Close this one. No, um, I guess. Can you see my screen? On that one, no. No, we're still waiting to view it. Oh, let me try this one more time for you. Thank you. Right. So, any second now, you should get a pop up above everything else on your screen that asks you to show your screen when ready. Yeah. And then just click share my screen when ready. Yeah, that, there's a no window pop up. Uh, well, that's, that's different. This is uh, different. okay. Uh, show my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Not yet. No. No, we're still waiting to view it. That's a strange because I already press a. Um, I press the function. See, show my screen. Um, okay. The other option, if you go to the go to webinar control panel, the main the main control uh, panel, um, yeah. the first first box at the top should say sharing. Yes. If you can uh, open that, and underneath the play button, there's a drop down menu which will allow you to to choose what screen to share. And if you, uh, you should be able to choose one from there. I cannot see anything that because uh, sharing here, I can see your screen, um, the one slide that you show there, and yeah. be, and then show. And then, and then, there you go. Okay, yeah, we can see that now. So if you just pop that into, uh, if you just pop yeah. that into presentation mode. Good, good. Uh, thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Um, that that takes about a few minutes. <laughs> Um, so what I will talk about is a little broad, um, not only related to the project um, uh, I submitted for this award, uh, but a little bit broad about the research area in my group, covering all according to the SIF, is um, storage sonality uh, into a sustainable view. Um, yes, uh, my name is Jim Wang Tang from Uni uh, University College of London. Um, oops. So the reason we are interested in uh, solar energy storage is because we all know uh, we want to move from a current fossil fuel economy to the um, uh, sustainable economy. Um, if you look at this um, renewable energy source that can support a sustainable society. Um, if you look at the um, energy we consumed over the last few years, uh, average uh, each year we, we 
roughly consuming 15 terawatts. And you look at this, um, all the capacity uh, of the renewable energy sources, uh, if we can see only this wind energy and the solar can meet our current and future increased energy demand. Uh, but wind is, is good, but it's not very popular in all countries. Somewhere in the UK is good, but the other countries are very difficult. But solar energy is widespread. So if you look at this uh, capacity, it's maybe uh, 10,000 more uh, than we need. So even though we um, just convert this one, a small portion, that's enough to meet our uh, future energy demand. That's where we work on solar storage. Um, okay. So the, the, the fundamental behind this one is we need a catalyst, and that catalyst uh, um, can first capture the sunlight, and that's step one. And the second step, we generate a negative and positive charge. And the last step is a reaction between the negative charge, such as uh, protein, get hydrogen, and uh, water uh, reacting with positive charge, we get oxygen gas. Uh, the whole process, of course, is uh, solar hydrogen production from water. So that's uh, one way to store solar energy into hydrogen gas. Uh, equivalent, we also can, um, sorry, um, we also can use uh, electron reduced CO2 uh, to get a fuel such as uh, a carbon monoxide, uh, probably more prefer, sorry, uh, prefer this one, uh, uh, alcohol, because this one uh, can be stored easily. Uh, and the other half reaction similar is uh, oxygen water to get oxygen gas. And this process we see the store soon energy into either carbon monoxide or syn gas or, or alcohols. Um, the key issue here, is to control, um, see, um, is control the one is efficiency. You want uh, uh, to utilize this uh, photon energy uh, as much as possible, as high as possible. Uh, and uh, we, more important for us is control the selectivity. So we, such as for CO2 conversion, we prefer to produce um, uh, methanol uh, instead of carbon monoxide. So um, that's why uh, in my group, we work on different um, catalysts called the photocatalyst to either um, store solar energy into hydrogen gas uh, or um, store solar energy into um, uh, alcohol by this CO2 conversion. Uh, and the, the other one is to um, synthesize uh, ammonia from natural gas. That's again, uh, storage of uh, uh, solar energy into ammonia. And last one is convert these um, very small organic molecules, methane to um, carbon two or carbon three, such as uh, ethanol or methanol. And that's quite useful. Um, in parallel, in, in our group, uh, we work on um, fundamental understanding using these two um, state-of-art spectroscopy. And this one uh, is, a, is a double laser system, which allows us to observe the charge dynamics, that's electron negative charge or positive charge hold, all the way from nanoseconds, um, sorry, that's my mouse, uh, from nanoseconds to uh, second time scale. And the other one is, um, uh, Intensive modulated photocurrent and photovoltaic spectroscopy. This one, uh, we can work out the charge kinetics. Um, and the other one we group work on is uh, microwave catalysis, and that can help to uh, recycle the plastic to the monomer. Uh, we can reuse the monomer to uh, re regenerate this uh, uh, plastic. So the, the next two th slides are introduce some uh, very uh, um, interesting results about this solar storage. And one is uh, about the hydrogen gas production from water. Uh, we um, learned from nature, sorry, um, from uh, nature photosynthesis, there's uh, um, two reaction center, one PS2 and that's PS1, and that's oxygen water to get oxygen gas, uh, and this one reduce CO2 to biomass. So exactly, um, we learned from nature, and we build our, our artificial uh, system, and we use this uh, metal oxide to produce oxygen gas, and this uh, polymer to produce hydrogen gas, so we can generate hydrogen fuel from water, only driven by sunlight nothing else we need. And that is the uh, first report so far, uh, as mentioned in the chemical engineering news, uh, we use organic uh, material, sorry, um, to uh, generate, um, uh, what's the problem? No? Okay, uh, to generate um, uh, hydrogen fuel from water. Um, and very recently, uh, we further modify our material catalyst. Uh, we can increase the uh, solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency at 26% at 400 nanometer, you can see, uh, after um, roughly eight hours, we generate about 30,000 uh, micromolar hydrogen gas, that's a lot. Um, the other one, uh, we use a sim catalyst, um, uh, load the catalyst as a polymer uh, catalyst. On, on top, we can load a very small spot, I'm not sure you can see that, it's a very small one, and that's carbon dots. When we load that one on this uh, polymer catalyst, we can convert uh, CO2 nearly 100% to methanol. Uh, and that, again, and that is the uh, first, uh, a report 
uh, and then this area. Um, and later uh, we found that uh, by modifying this polymer a little bit, um, we can further increase the energy physics to six uh, percent. Uh, that's for CO two conversion is quite high, and uh, that's because CO two conversion is much more difficult than what we need for hydrogen gas. Um, and last one, uh, we convert this uh, uh, smallest organic molecules, methane, to uh, methanol and uh, ethanol. Uh, uh, here we used uh, another catalyst that is atomic level N on TL2. So we can see um, after the run, we get a very good conversion and selectivity to methanol, uh, nearly 97% oh, <coughs> uh, to methanol. Uh, and then this is a batch reactor. Uh, re recently, we developed a flow reactor. You see, that's our reactor, and that's here, that source. So the uh, methane gas flow uh, into the reactor and come out. We almost convert that methane to carbon two. Uh, compared with the uh, methanol, you know, carbon two has a much higher value. Uh, and that's uh, what we are um, currently doing about solar storage. And then I welcome any comments and questions. Okay, thank you very much. So we will pause for a moment for questions. Shall I quit the sharing screen? Uh, if you feel free to leave it on for a moment, that's up to you. Uh, Dushant, I can see you, you're, you have a question. If you'd like to type that into the, the chat box and I can put that across to our presenter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for great presentation. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is kind of how do you scale up those things? You know, one thing you know, just uh, and the second thing you know, you mentioned about a microwave. Briefly mentioned about a, a microwave, let's just say plastic conversion, catalytic conversion. I, I missed it. I might have. So, can you talk about that one? If you have anything, you know, uh, regarding that. Okay. So uh, that's a very uh, challenging question for me. Um, so for this um, solar and storage, um, um, previously we worked on the batch react, and that was a big issue for scale up. Uh, recently we moved to the flow system, and that seems okay because um, for each flow system, uh, we can keep uh, pumping in this uh, uh, reactant such as methane or CO2, and then convert that to the final product by, by a solar driven chemical process. Uh, if you want to further increase that uh, production, uh, we can level up the reactor. So now we just run the reaction system. Or we can increase that to maybe 10 system, our production increase by a factor of 10. Uh, and, and I'm not sure as to answer your question, and that's my understanding. Uh, the other one is um, about this uh, plastic. Uh, plastic is, is um, relative, um, I see a new project in my group. Um, the reason because for plastic conversion, a lot of people you try to use the high temperature decomposition, and that's a very energy costly system. Now, microwave, uh, if you think of the microwave, the, 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 the beauty of microwave is um, the energy can be directly. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, input into the um, uh, somewhere such as to a catalyst uh, and that can dramatically increase the uh, or faster increase temperature of a catalyst to the temperature required for this uh, plastic decomposition. Uh, but the bulk temperature is very low. So that and I think that can increase energy efficiency. Uh, we did that experiment. Um, we used um, uh, most uh, uh, robust plastic with is a PET. Uh, you know, the, 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 the drink bottle. Uh, we got a drink bottle, we just wash it and cut a small piece and put it in our reactor and use our uh, catalyst together with the microwave. Uh, we can convert that to, in five minutes to um, uh, a transparent liquid, uh, and that's the monomer, uh, BHET. And then we separate BHET from a solvent. A solvent is um, adding glucose. Uh, we get a, a, a solid uh, a monomer. And that can be, uh, we further confirm the uh, purity of that uh, uh, monomer. Uh, by uh, um, HPLC, and uh, it seems quite a purified uh, product. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think that wraps up our questions. So thank you. And a big thank you to all of our finalists who have taken the time to be with us today and give us an insight into their work. And I'm sure you'll agree with some very impressive projects. So it's time to announce our winner, but first we will have our highly commended entries and they are the joint entry from Seren Technologies and Queen's University Belfast and the joint entry from Promethean Particles, BAE Systems, CAV Advanced Technologies, GKN Aerospace Services, London South Bank University, Opus Materials Technologies, P3 
PPG Industries and TWI. So well done to everyone who contributed to those projects. But now for the winner. So ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the ICME 2020 Research Project Award sponsored by the Chemical Engineer is the joint entry by the US National Energy Technology Laboratory and West Virginia University. So congratulations to Dushant and everybody associated with this year's winning entry. Dushant, if we can get you back on the line, how does it feel to be an ICME Award winner? Wow, wow, thank you, thank you. Okay, oh wow, that's good. And uh, firstly, I think uh, uh, I would like to congratulate other finalists. And I really enjoyed, you know, presentation, great work, great work, great work, you know, just to, you know, and. Uh, Please continue your great work, okay? And I, I am really feel privileged to speak with you know just uh, this uh, you know seminar and in front of like you know top researchers around the world. So that was great. That's great, good, okay? And uh, okay, again, this is a great uh, honor to receive this prestigious award on the behalf of my you know uh, from joint for for joint uh, you know uh, uh, nomination of NETL and WVU. Okay, so again, thanks for like you know, Sister Institution of Chemical Engineers for providing me an opportunity to you know present there, and uh, that was a great honor for me. And uh, we, I really appreciate that. And again, I would like to thank my colleagues from uh, West Virginia University, uh, uh, Dr. John Hu and his team for great work and great collaborative environment, and uh, also. Also, my group, my team, particularly for my NTL, National Energy Technology Lab, Dr. Christina Wildfire, and other researchers in NTL. So, again, and also, also thank the uh, Department of Energies, RPIE, for funding uh, this work. And uh, I think this is, a, I believe, you know, um, you know this microwave assistive technology is a kind of, I think, uh, would be a game changer. And uh, and that, you know we are getting a lot of attention. You know we have a lot of people like you know just uh, and uh, uh, you know, asking about you know uh, you know licensing and technology transfer. And uh, so we are in the process and we'll keep you updated. You know what happens. You know I think uh, uh, yeah uh, uh, you know producing ammonia at low temperature and pressure that was uh, I think uh, I think it could be a solution for uh, those uh, standard resources, renewable sources, and uh, uh, you know, for some not only ammonia synthesis, uh, microwave could play also significant uh, role in uh, some other chemical and uh, chemical conversion processes. So thanks again for you know and giving me opportunity, and uh, I really appreciate that. Thanks. Okay, well, look, thank you. Congratulations once again. And thank you to all of our finalists and everybody who has joined us this afternoon. We've got plenty more ICME Award webinars coming thick and fast throughout November. But for this afternoon's session, it is the end. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.